As an economist, I'm uh, supposed to tell you a lot of bad news. So let me start off with pointing out that, as you know, you are not living through the usual recession. Uh, and we know now what financial crises are like and how they are very different from run-of-the-mill recessions. Uh, some people like to look at the U.S. and treat it as if it's its own country and that what happens here can't be compared to what happens anywhere else. Um, my colleagues and I in economics are, are not, not convinced of that. Um, Carmen Reinhart and Ken Rogoff, both great famous economists, um, have written a new book that sums up a lot of this research about what, how financial crises are so different from normal recessions. And one of the insights that they come up with along the way is they found out that government tax revenues tend to plummet after financial crises and stay low for years and years and years. So, um, so by financial crisis, we mean something that's, you know, where the banking system collapses or there have to be bailouts or the stock market plummets and there's massive government intervention afterwards. These kinds of things, things that happened in the U.S. in the last couple of years, things that happened in East Asia in the late 90s, things that happened in Japan in the early 90s and in Sweden in the late 80s. Um, what we know is that um, in the few years, this is just the three years after a financial crisis in the typical country, the value of government debt tends to explode by an average of 86%, so almost doubling in just three years, right? And in the U.S., there's a lot of people are noticing, wow, the debt's going up. Wow, deficits are really big. Um, what's this caused by? Is this caused by big collapses in government revenues, or is it caused by big extra government spending? Um, well. Reinhardt and Rogoff, looking around the world, noticed that the main cause is the inevitable collapse in tax revenues. Looking at the U.S. experience, we fit in with that just fine. Um, we, ha we, like the Japanese, after their crisis, um, and unlike many other countries, went on a big government spending binge, uh, but that's still not big enough to explain what's going on. So um, this book's been a, a great seller if you want to get a good sense of what financial crises are like. Um, just as medical doctors need to know uh, what a cold is like, what a flu is like, and the way you learn that isn't by just talking to one person or asking for a couple of anecdotes. You look at a lot of data. Here, Reinhardt Rogoff looked at eight centuries of financial folly and summed it all up. So uh, you'll certainly be hearing a lot about this book in the next few years. So there's going to be a lot less revenue. Um, here I uh, took a slide from the CBO director, Congressional Budget Office Director Elmendorf's uh, presentation. He has been giving great and very candid presentations about the long-run fiscal state of the United States. Um, CBO publications for years have done a good job reminding, uh, trying to remind members of Congress and their staffs about the long-run um, commitments that, that your bosses have made and how difficult it will be to keep those over the next few decades. Um, so, so here um, Elmendorf does something which is a little unusual for uh, the CBO and, and very practical. They just, he just assumes, let's, let's, usually the CBO, when they project the future, that by law, they have to project by saying, we have to act as under current law. So we have to assume, for instance, under current law, all of the tax cuts, all of the Bush tax cuts expire in the end of this year. Um, by law, they have to assume that the AMT fix is not going to be plugged in. By law, they have to assume the doc fix won't get renewed. That's the standard CBO set of rules. Here, um, he does something that's normal, that's common sense, which is he says, let's see what rev government revenues will be like if we just keep doing what we've been doing lately. Renew the usual things that we usually wait until the last minute to renew. So here he says, here's the, the dark blue line tells us what government revenues will look like over the next decade or so. And it's a projection, it's a forecast. Forecasts are noisy. But assuming that the Bush tax cuts are extended, and the alternative minimum tax, the AMT, um, keeps being indexed, uh, keeps being uh, bumped up, and in this case, indexed for inflation. I think that's what he's indexing it for, inflation. And um, the blue line isn't all, the light blue line isn't all government spending. It's um, just basically the, the things that we talk about. It's just the Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, defense, and net interest. Things that most of us in this room think just, well, you, you're gonna have to keep that promise one way or the other. Um, and as you can see, um, you know, just for the next couple of years, um, government tax revenues just aren't going to be enough to, or haven't been enough to cover um, 
even those, those core programs. And so we've been borrowing to pay for the rest. But uh, even after the CBO thinks the recovery is going to kick in and revenues are going to start drifting back up again, you see that um, in a few years, by the end of the decade, uh, we'll be in a world where, once again, the entire federal take, income taxes, social security taxes, corporate income taxes, will not be enough to cover just Medicare, Medicaid, social security defense, and uh, interest on the debt. So, um, so if there are other parts of government you want to pay for, um, you know, you better, I don't know, take, start taking a collection. Um, now, one thing I should point out is that the CBO's assumption, the CBO's forecast about um, how revenues are going to recover, you can see. CBO is noticing here, boom, they, they notice a big collapse in revenues, and they're assuming things are going to kind of bottom out for this year, and then they'll start recovering. Uh, but they see this big, big recovery in 2011. I'm not that confident. A lot of my colleagues are not that confident. They think that's a little bit, a bit of a rosy scenario, but not by much. Um, their, their projections are still, in turn, a bit, more opti a bit more pessimistic than the administration's forecast. The administration's forecast thinks that we're basically in a normal recession, where when things go down, they come right back up quickly. Um, the CBO isn't quite as sanguine. They think things go down, they're going to bottom out for a while, and then sort of drift back up. Um, the experience of Japan, not, not as good as this. So. If you want to know what the normal U.S. tax take is like for the federal government, it's a remarkably stable number, 18%. We don't get many nice round numbers in econ, but this one is one that's basically held true since the end of World War II. Well, basically since the Korean War. So 48 is where economists sort of start thinking of a return, uh, that as a return to normal life. From 48 to, you know, a couple of weeks ago, the long run average take of the government is 18%. It's almost like there's an iron law. It's not a, a law of economics, really, of course. That's a law of politics. It's a law of what your bosses have helped create. Right? There seems to be some process at work in, a, in the American political system, not an economic law, really, more of a political law, that 18 is the number it drifts up to. If it gets higher than that, it seems to kind of head back down to 18. It got up to about 20, 21 during the late Clinton years as the economy really boomed and the government brought in a lot of capital gains and a lot of investment and a lot of high income revenue, a lot of income from the rich during the Clinton years. Drifted up to 21. It's drifting back down now to, drifting down to a super low level, about 15. Uh, but the CBO thinks that their best guess is, you know, um, Director Elmendorf's best guess is in the long run we go, we go back to 18. My hunch is it takes a little longer than they think, but I'm, th that's arguing over quibbles. So 18 is what you got, unless something really big changes in the American political life. So um, let's get a, let me give you a sense of who's actually paying these taxes. Here I'm not looking at federal income taxes. A lot of people um, like to hear about um, who pays the federal income tax. As you know, the bottom half of households on average pay very little federal income tax because of the standard deduction because of the child tax credit, because of mortgage interest deductions, because of the earned income tax credit. The, the majority of people in the bottom half of the income distribution pay very little federal income 1040 type taxes. But that's not the only tax. There's Social Security taxes. There's federal excise taxes on things like alcohol and tobacco. Um, there's uh, corporate income taxes that people pay indirectly. Um, there's tariffs that you pay on some imports from foreign countries. So, um, so let's add, so what this does is this adds all of that in. This from, comes from the CBO. If you want a one-stop shop for this, I'm amazed. I, I'm not normally a tax guy in my day-to-day -day life now. I'm a macroeconomist. I focus on business cycles, long-run growth. I uh, still keep an eye on the tax system, but I dive into this every, every few months and look at it. And I'm amazed at how the um, Tax Policy Center keeps fantastic data on their website. I was, um, it's, uh, their website is taxpolicycenter.org. It's a joint project of Brookings and the Urban Institute. And it's just fantastic data, regardless of your political leanings. It's just, they, then they pull data from CBO, they pull data from IRS. Um, the most, sort of the most exciting, maybe not, maybe not the most noble part of their website, but the most exciting part to read is 
they're summaries of the uh, income tax forms of the 400 richest Americans every year. So they have a nice little summary of here's what their incomes are like, here's what their standard deduction, here's what their deductions are like, here's what their capital gains are like. It's all a breakdown of the 400 richest Americans every year. The surprising thing about that number that you should keep in mind when thinking about what it means to tax the rich is that um, the 400 is a, basically a different group every year. The top 400 is a different group. They looked over uh, 12 years of data, I think it was, it might have been 15. 12 years of data, let's say it was. And there were actually 2,400 people, 2,400 different families in this group of the 400 richest families over this 12 year period. So only a few families, only a few individuals were, were repeats for more than, um, more than two years. Only a tiny number were repeats for more than three years. So it's, the 400 richest Americans is a different group every year. So it's not quite, uh, according to the IRS, according to tax statistics. Um, so things in the real world are not as stable as you would think from reading the Forbes 400 list or something like that. So with that in mind, see this is just breaking it down by quintiles. Quintiles are 20%. So this is the lowest 20%, the middle, the highest 20%. Um, the gray bar is their share of federal tax liabilities, and the uh, blue bar is their share of before tax income. Um, and as you can see, so the, um, the top 20% of Americans earn about 58 or so percent of the income, and they pay about 70 or so percent of all federal taxes, federal including income, Social Security, and the rest. Um, People in the lowest quintile, we often hear that um, people in the lowest quintile certainly do pay taxes. They're not just, just because they're getting away with not paying federal income tax doesn't mean they're not paying tax. But um, that bar's pretty low. It's, it's still positive. It, you can might be able to see, I think it's like one pixel on this screen. So maybe it's two pixels, I'm not sure. It depends on you know, what the resolution is to use. So, but you can see that the lowest quintile is um, getting a great deal from from their government, uh, presumably. I mean, it's a little bit of a judgment call whether they're getting a great deal or not, but they're not paying that much. Of course, a fact to keep in mind is what's go what I said about the top is also true at the bottom. Just at the people at the top 400 isn't the same list every year. Similarly, the people in the bottom quintile aren't the same folks every year. People bounce back and forth. Bouncing between two quintiles over the course of your life, very common. Bouncing over three from year to year as you go from your first year out of college to getting a decent job to the year you sell a home to the year that you're sick, these things bounce you around the course of normal life events. Um, but on average, you can see that our system is quite, is, is progressive. I don't know if it's the right level of progressivity, too much or too little, but it's just as a raw matter of objective fact. The federal, total federal tax system is, is progressive. So people at the top are paying um, more than their share in the income. And people at the bottom are, are paying less. Um, here's a broken down by, um, with some more facts. Um, I want to use this to focus on the, the raw dollars. So let's look at the top 1%, which I think are a fascinating group and they're always worth talking about. Um, that's who we spend most of our time uh, reading about on gossip websites and it's probably who we spend, we spend a lot of our time talking about on, when th talking about tax policy. Um, so the top 1%, the average person in the top 1% is earning what? Uh, this is 2005 data, right? It's reasonable to use 05 or 06 because that might have been sort of the last normal year that we've had in American history, right? So from 07 on, there have been, you know, with the financial crisis, it's a little hard to compare that. So 05 is a nice sort of normal year in American politics. So people in the top 1% earning the average person in that group, I think that's the mean, not the median, $1.5 million. Let me round that. I just let me round that to a million and a half dollars. That's good, solid money. Um, and um, the typical person in this group is paying how much in total federal taxes? Um, half a million dollars. So, I mean, wow, that's, that's a lot of money. It's, I, mean, I mean, a million and a half dollars is a lot of money. That's a lot of money to make. Um, and um, so they're paying an average rate of 31% of their income in um, taxes. And as you can see, this number uh, does rise in terms of the percentages as you go higher and higher through the income distribution. People at the top are paying a higher average tax rate. 
um, 31% of their income on average. And the people at the bottom here, lowest quintile, 4.3%. Uh, so maybe it looks a little higher than that, than that chart um, of their income in taxes. And um, so, it, so debates about tax policy, if they, if they want to be about the raw amount of money people are paying or the percentage of your income, again, we see that it is, it is progressive. I, I'm not a philosopher. I'm not a moral philosopher. Um, so I'm not in a position to say what the right number should be here. But, um, you know, half a million dollars is a lot of money. So, um, and again, this is all federal taxes. So now there's always a distinction between perception and reality, right? Um, and you might want to know what do, your cons what do your boss's constituents think reality is? So just this week, uh, one of our very talented PhD students at George Mason defended a, a really great dissertation. I mean, it was, it was a great dissertation. Um, and what he did is he looked at how, what, the, what public opinion says about tax policy. What do typical people believe about tax policy and does it match up with the truth? Do people know how their government works? Uh, my colleague, Brian, he did this under my, um, this dissertation was supervised by my colleague Brian Kaplan, who wrote a book, The Myth of the Rational Voter. Princeton University Press, fantastic book, got a lot of press. It was a Financial Times book of the year. He pointed out that voters systematically misunderstand just the raw facts of, of American politics, and they also misunderstand raw facts of economics as well. Um, so it's hard to imagine voters making wise decisions if they don't actually understand how the system works. Um, so it's easy to compare people. It's, it's easy to survey people and say, how much do you think you pay in taxes? And then compare it to what they actually pay. Right? If, you, if, you compare, if you survey a bunch of low-income Americans and ask them, how much do you think you pay in taxes? And you talk, talk, talk to the top bottom 20% and ask them. Then you compare it against reality. Are they right? Are they wrong? So Gerald did this. And um, he, uh, as I said, a newly minted PhD. Um, he now works at the, he's been working at the Tax Foundation here in Washington, DC. And um, I, I hope this work gets uh, some great attention. Um, this is just one of, he, he wrote 100 pages with about 300 pages of tables. Uh, this is just one little fact to pull out. Americans underestimate the share of taxes paid by the rich, and they overestimate the share paid by middle income Americans. So as you know, if you survey Americans, you probably know this. If you survey Americans and ask them, do you think you're middle class? 80% of Americans say they're middle class. Right? So um, very few Americans say that they're part of the rich or, or upper class. And very few actually also say they're poor, too. Um, so they, um, they overestimate the share of taxes paid by folks like themselves. And they think that the rich are paying very little. Um, he, tries to he tries to explain why he thinks this is going on. You can come up with your own explanations. He didn't have a test of this, so he, he's sort of having to think this through on his own. One of his explanations is pride theory. You want to think that you're chipping in a lot to the government. Alternatively, you might think of it as the man is sticking it to me. Man, I'm always getting beaten down. Gosh. Um, so, uh, and um, another version of this is class delusion. People want to think they're richer than they are. And maybe they have a sense that the rich pay more in taxes. And so they think, well, I'm rich. But so people do systematically think they're paying more in taxes than they, than they actually are. People in the middle think that they're paying much more. So there's a lot of, lot of irrationality among, among voters. They really don't know how the system's working. The same people who could tell you how to fix a car or the same people who could tell you um, how to cook a great um, omelet couldn't tell you the first thing about um, how the US tax system works. So um, over the next few years, uh, certainly your bosses are going to be looking for different kinds of revenue raisers. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the different options that exist out there. Uh, one that gets a lot of attention here is something called the value added tax, um, the VAT. Um, it's a consumption tax. Every other country in the OECD, that's a rich countries club, the Organization for Economic Cooperation Development, every other country except for us has a, has a VAT. So we're the holdouts. The United States, this is a, this is a case of American exceptionalism. You know, there's, this comes up often in American history. America is an exceptionalistic nation, exceptional nation in a lot of ways. The VAT is one, we've, we've been, we're the holdout. So um, this economist Keen is certainly the go-to person for quotes uh, who's done an enormous amount of research. He's at the IMF. Uh, does an enormous amount of research on VAT. Um, just looking through his papers and looking through he's, who he cites is a, a good tool.
poor. So people should be bringing him up on the hill to talk. Um, and he starts off a, a survey article, a, a non-technical, completely non-technical survey article in the, a top economics journal this way. If economists were to vote for their favorite tax, the VAT would surely be high on the list. Uh, and now the question is why. I'll get to more detail on this later. But for now, let me say that economists in general favor consumption taxes over broad income taxes. Economists generally think that you should tax, if you tax labor, if you tax all income, you tend to get less of it. Whereas if you tax consumption, what are you encouraging? You're encouraging saving, you're encouraging thinking for the future, you're encouraging investment and building up machines and equipment so that you can produce more in the future. So the VAT is a one form of consumption tax. Another form of a tax on consumption is one that we're all familiar with, a, a sales tax. States really have these things all the time. States have, most states have, have sales taxes as a big revenue raiser. Uh, some people have proposed a national retail sales tax as a way of solving this problem. Um, some people have proposed it uh, in, a, in a book called Fair Tax, right? Um, as a, a complete replacement for the US income tax. Uh, the rate to make that work would have to be around 30 some odd percent apparently, uh, as a national retail sales tax rate. Um, but both are the same story. Both, both VAT and a national retail sales tax are a way of getting at this problem of, or a way of raising a lot of money by taxing consumers. Um, does anyone know how a VAT works and how it works differently than a sales tax? Who pays a sales tax? Who, excuse me, first, as a matter of law, who pays a sales tax? Well, literally, it's the business writing the check to the government. But as, as you probably know, the, who bears the burden of a tax has nothing to do with who legally cuts the check, right? Um, one way you can make a business bear the burden of a tax, let me think of a classic example. Suppose there's, um, if, think of, a, think of a, a, I want to tax one gas station in a town or on a street corner. Say I've got a street corner with four gas stations and the city government decides to only put a tax on one of those four gas stations. You know, 10 cents a gallon. Is that one gas station owner going to be able to pass the tax on to the consumer at all? No. They're going to have to cut their price because the people go, customers will just go to the other three gas stations. If they try to raise it more than a penny or two, people just, everybody goes to the other gas station. So in that case, the tax is borne by completely by the business owner. By contrast, if you taxed all, if you had the, imposed the same 10 cents a gallon tax on every gas station in town, then they would probably be able to raise the gas tax a couple of cents. They would, be, excuse me, they would be able to raise the retail price of gas a couple of cents. All of the, if, if everybody is stuck with the same burden, then they have a chance of passing it on to consumers. Here's an extreme version of it, which I saw in an econ textbook decades ago. Um, the city of Washington, D.C., actually, the city, tried to, they thought, well, everybody needs to buy gasoline, so we're going to tax gasoline. And so they passed a big, big sales tax on gasoline. Maybe this was in the 80s or the 70s. I'm not sure when. It's better, it's better told just as a fable, right, rather than worrying about the actual facts. Once upon a time, there was a place where, so what happened afterwards? You don't know the history, you don't know about this story, but you know what happened afterwards when Washington, D.C. decided to raise its gas tax by a lot. What did people do? They bought it in Maryland and Virginia. So this is the core, a core idea in taxation. If people have good substitutes that they can switch to easily, that tax isn't going to raise a lot of revenue, and it's going to hurt some core group of people especially badly. Right? It, destroys, it destroys gas stations. Right? So if people have good alternatives, to the thing that you're taxing, they'll switch to it. Um, so interestingly, a lot of countries that have, um, so retail sales tax is legally paid just at the, just at the final consumer. The, you see, the final business. So I go to the, I go to the 7-Eleven, the 7-Eleven charges, a, you know, has a sales tax. You know, every month or so, they have to cut a check to the state government, maybe the county. Here's how much the revenue is. Um, now, when somebody has a, runs a retail sales tax, when a government runs a retail sales tax, businesses have a pretty strong incentive to sell things under the table then, right? 
They could sell things under the table as a way to make money, or even better, they can just buy the stuff as business people and then keep it for themselves. Okay? So I have, uh, so my personal plan, if the US government ever, ever um, starts a national retail sales tax, is I'm going to start a small business. I'm going to start a small business. And my job is going to be to basically resell stuff that I buy on the internet. Right? So I should, because I'll be a business person, I won't have to pay the, the sales tax because I'm buying it for my business. Right? So I, I'll just go and buy stuff. I'll buy like, well, my business involves selling a bunch of clothes, so I'm going to buy a bunch of clothes. I won't have to pay any tax on that because this is for my business. Um, maybe I'll buy a house because I need a house. Maybe I'll sell houses too. I'll buy a computer. I need a computer. to Maybe I'll sell computers too. So I buy all these things, and then what will I keep it as? I'll keep it as inventory. Keep it as inventory. So uh, my mom has a next door neighbor who's a fantastic woman, and uh, she does um, antique. She's an antique collector, right? So um, she loves antiques, and she's actually very good at selling them and, and runs, some, runs a couple of great shops. Where does she keep the inventory? Does she keep the inventory in some closet or in some warehouse somewhere? No, she keeps it in her house. She keeps the things she likes best in her house. That's her inventory. So that's one of the great things about owning a small business is that like the inventory, which you're not taxed on while it's sitting there as an inventory, that uh, you don't have to pay tax on it. So um, I, I, when, when people advocate the national retail sales tax, I always think, well, if it ever happens, I know what I'm going to do. So national retail sales taxes, just like states' sales taxes, are pretty easy to evade if you have your own business. Um, to some people, that's a feature, not a bug. So, um, so states generally avoid high sales tax rates for that reason. They don't push them up that high because when you push them up too high, there's a lot of evasion. Part of it is that you know, people can move across state borders or whatever, but um, just, just evading by selling under the table or starting your own business is another way to avoid it. Um, the value-added tax gets the same eek to an economist not thinking of the, how the government bureaucracy works, but think of it as the raw economics of it. And that's the very same thing. Um, it is a tax on final sales, but instead of just taxing it all at the end, you tax a little bit each at each step of the way. So let's say a product, um, let's say there's, uh, there's two steps in a production process. You know, you have somebody chops down a tree, and they um, fast fashion it into a canoe, and then they sell it to a canoe salesman. And the salesman, the canoe salesman has a little shop and sells the canoe. So two steps. Under a national retail sales tax, the only person who has to pay tax to the government is the person running the canoe shop. They pay whatever price they, to the, to the forester they want. And then the sales tax all just gets paid at the end. Under a VAT, how does it work? Under a VAT, it's a two-step process. The person who makes the, who chops down the tree and fashions it into a canoe, say the canoe's worth 50 bucks at that point, he has to pay, he added $50 in value. So there's $50 in value added on that canoe. He sells it for $50 to the canoe shop, and he has to pay a tax just on the value that he added in his step of the chain. So that's what value added tax means. So if it's a 10% rate, $50 for the canoe, he'd pay $5 to the central government. So then the next step, person with the canoe shop. Paid $50 for a canoe, let's say he sells it for $75. How much value added was there? I bought something for 50, I sell it for 75. I added 25 bucks in value. $25 in value. So all he pays tax on is not the whole 75, but just on the value added, the 25. So you, add, you only pay a tax on the value that you add to the process. So, um, the surpri so as you might imagine, one of the, from a government's point of view, from a government's point of view, the strength of the VAT over a retail sales tax is that you only have to you collect a little bit at each step of the chain. So therefore, you learn. Therefore, you don't have to worry about one person along the way just not paying you, and you get nothing. So. Another strength of the VAT from the government's point of view is that people are all end up ratting on each other as part of the tax process. You end up getting a lot of businesses to spill the beans about 
where their revenues are coming from, who they're buying stuff from. And this turns out to be very helpful in enforcing income taxes. So some countries that have um, actually, countries, governments know this, right? Because in order to run a VAT, in order to run a value added tax, every business wants to be really, collect really great records on everything they bought from everybody. Why? Because they get to deduct that. You only pay tax on the value you added, so you want to tell people, well, I had to pay a lot of money for electricity. I had to pay a lot of money for uh, all the materials that I bought. I had to pay a lot of money maybe for rent. I had to pay a lot of money to a lot of people to build this process. So you want to report all of your costs. In turn, what you're doing when you report that, the government gets that data, and then they, the government says, oh, you, you paid $2 million to this um, computer firm two years ago? Oh, that computer firm told us they only um, sold a million and a half to you. But you're saying it was two million. Huh. So there's, when numbers don't match up, when the sales of one company don't match up with the purchases of another, um, that means that there's some uh, discrepancy and it gives, the, it gives your government's tax collection agencies a lot of power to go in and try to reconcile things. So people have an incentive to report, it solves some, some honesty problems. Um, if you see those as problems. So surprisingly, so these are really, I mean, incredible revenue generators. Actually, the ability of the VAT to sort of help wrap people out on the income tax side is so strong that some countries, I want to say it was Ghana. I can't remember. It was in Keene's article, actually. One of Keene's articles talked about this. Um, Keene pointed out that one country that um, created a VAT promised that it would not use the data from the VAT and hand it over to the income tax side. So they promised like an iron wall, you know, uh, a, a steel wall between the income tax side of the tax, government tax agency and the VAT side. We promise not to share information. We know this information is very powerful and we promise not to share it. So, um, Another thing that happens with VATs is that most countries that have VATs end up carving out exceptions. Some carve it out for medical care. Oh, we, want, we don't want to have a sales tax on medical care. Oh, we don't want to have a sales tax for basic food. Oh, we don't want to have a sales tax for whatever. Um, so Britain has the most holes in their VAT of any of the rich countries uh, that have them. They have a, you know, you're taxing some things, you're not taxing other things. You by now know what that means. It means people just shift their purchases over to whatever's not being taxed. Oh, so you're not going to tax food, but you are going to tax uh, movie tickets? OK, I guess my friends and I will have more dinner parties and less nights at the movies. So you're using the tax system to change the way people live their lives, especially when it's a 20 or 30% tax rate. 15, 12 to 15 is more common. Once it starts getting up higher than that, you can imagine. People start building their lives around it. Um, so uh, Keen noted that um, The VAT tends to be an incredibly efficient revenue raiser. I think I might have used this phrase already, that it seems to be a money machine for a lot of governments. Uh, to some people, that's a feature, and to some people, that's a bug. Uh, my colleague at um, George Mason, uh, the Nobel Prize winner Jim Buchanan, wrote back decades ago an our, a book with um, uh, Brennan, Brennan and Buchanan. They wrote a number of articles and, and a book on this topic, and they argued that for political economy reasons, for political reasons, they thought that it was a bad idea to create a tax system that was too efficient. Because if you create one that's too efficient, then government will tend to keep the tax revenue for itself, use it for its own selfish purposes, and it will tend to not use it for um, the best interest of the citizens. So an efficient tax system in the Buchanan worldview is uh, a bit of a bug, not a feature. Um, to others, though, um, if, you, if you think that the government tends to pick its, make its choices wisely, then you're more comfortable saying, well, let's just have the best tax system that works. Let's, we've got to, we're going to spend some stuff. We've already decided. We've got a bunch of old people, and they're going to keep getting older. We're going to pay for the health care. We don't want to pull the plug on them. How are we going to raise the money for that? Well, this thing works. So, some pe so the big choice that you and your bosses are going to face over the next decade is um, as government spending is rising, um, if you're going to decide to keep paying for it, what is going to be your choice? If you have a choice between 
raising a lot of income tax rates or choosing a VAT, this is going to be a, this is certainly going to be one of your options. Um, so one thing that Keen noted in a paper uh, that countries that switch to the VAT on average, rich countries, OECD countries, I'm not talking about third world countries, countries where people are living on $2 a day. In the rich countries, when countries switch to VATs, two things tend to happen, one of which is the thing that doesn't happen. One thing that tends to happen is that on average, other taxes come down a little. There is substitution in the tax system, not dollar for dollar. Governments that switch to a VAT, governments that add on a VAT tend to raise more money overall. But they tend to cut something else. So you can imagine that with something, you could imagine something like that happening in the US, right? We say, okay, well, we're gonna raise a VAT and we're gonna, at the same time, we're gonna cut taxes for these special folks on the income tax side. You can imagine something like that happening. That bundle, that deal tends to happen a lot around the world where you raise the tax in one place and you cut it a little bit somewhere else as part of the deal. Um, another thing is that Keen, um, in, his, in this work that I actually uh, wrote, a, I tweeted, and then my colleague uh, Tyler Cowan linked to it um, on his blog, Marginal Revolution, just this morning, um, is that it seems that on average in the OECD, the, when, you, when you kick in a VAT, government spending doesn't tend to change from, where, from its old path. So government spending seems to be the thing that's stuck and it's government taxation, taxation revenue that wiggles. So many people worry, uh, people who are opposed to more government spending, they worry that if you add in a VAT, A, more money's gonna come in, and B, government is gonna spend all that money. Um, maybe the US is a special place where that will happen, but on average, that doesn't seem to be what's happening in the other rich countries. In the other rich countries, um, a switch to a VAT means two things a small cut in other taxes, and no apparent change in the government's long-run spending path. So it's a way to pay for the stuff that their voters told them they already had to buy anyway. So um, uh, there are a lot of uh, raisers that come around during times of trouble, uh, revenue raisers. One is taxing sin. Um, some forms of taxing sin are, um, you know, we think of alcohol, tobacco, sugary sodas. Um, other forms of taxing sin involve, say, pollution taxes. Um, in general, economists are, they, they'll tell you one thing. Tax things you want less of, don't tax things you want more of, right? So, um, personally, I, I drink Diet Coke, so uh, you go ahead and tax all the sugary sodas you want. That's no skin off my nose, right? That'll have no impact on me, as far as I can tell. Um, but I can tell you that if uh, you start taxing sugary sodas, um, people can easily find a lot of great substitutes. So the level of substitution, is, it's a little bit like going to be like taxing one gas station on a street corner. Um, my colleagues at the Mercatus Center, Richard Williams and Caitlin Christ, have a, have a short four-page policy brief that goes over excise taxes and some of their, uh, their uh, benefits and costs of them. It's well, one of the things that people often point out about these kinds of sin taxes, do I have a laser here? Yeah, I do is that um, these are items that tend to be purchased by uh, the poor in percentage terms as a bigger amount. In percentage terms, um, the poor spend more on alcohol. In terms of total dollars, the rich spend more on alcohol. I used to, uh, I got my PhD at UC San Diego in, in La Jolla, right? Which is kind of a posh neighborhood, kind of a little too posh to put a college in. You know, it's, it's tough being a grad student living, on, living there. But um, part of what you see is uh, you, you learn a lot about how the rich live um, when you're in this, fancy neighborhood and there are a lot of liquor stores there and they carry nice stuff so in dollar terms the rich spend more on alcohol than the poor probably not with tobacco anymore I don't know that so. but um, in percentage terms they uh, the rich spend less so um, so it is a tax that in percentage terms tends to fall more heavily on the poor um, as you notice from the last slide though the poor aren't paying the bottom 20% aren't paying uh, that high a percentage compared to the rich anyway. So maybe that's a feature, not a bug. Um, but this is, a, this is certainly the kind of thing that gets debated in Washington. Um, one fact, is this, I, like, I just always like an excuse to talk about how taxes change people's behavior. And I looked at the literature on this, which I hadn't been familiar with. Um, and a number of studies showed the same thing. This was, uh, oh, this was a, summer, a survey of some folks. Um, 
But um, young people uh, really change their cigarette and alcohol purchases um, when taxes change. They really are strapped for cash. Um, and 12 to 17 seem to, seem to change more. And, but over 35s, um, once people, um, I guess, settle into, excuse me, settle into their ways, they seem to be more stubborn. Um, I saw one uh, nice study that showed that um, apparently when you raise the tax on alcohol, uh, young people are more likely to smoke pot. So <laughs> they switch over to the substitute. So substitutes are everywhere. Substitutes are everywhere. It's not just like, do I work or do I stay home? It's do I work, do I go to school, do I stay home? Do I take care of the kids? Do I help take care of my sick grandmother? There's so many choices that people have in their lives. And, and tax policy changes all that. Um, another way to raise taxes is um, to uh, get rid of all these uh, little extra lines on the 1040 form. Um, this is one that will certainly come up in the next few years. The Obama administration has proposed a miniature version of this, um, but uh, certainly bigger versions will come down the pike in future years. So tax expenditures is the IRS's term for um, what normal people call loopholes. Uh, but it's only a loophole when it's somebody else's, right? When it's you, it's like, you know, it's a patriotic duty or something, right? I think that's what you're Is that patriotic duty? Do they still use that word here or is that old fashioned? I think they use patriotic duty. So, um, so the IRS has been keeping track of these things since the 70s, um, and it's been a great thing that they've been doing it. And uh, so tax expenditures are just anything that's an exception to the normal rates. Anything that's an exception to the normal rates that are, you know, in the first page or two of the tax code. And the five biggest. Um, are the tax-free, the fact that health um, purchases by your employer are tax-free, um, the mortgage interest deduction, which of course is never going away, um, although President Clinton did manage to cap it at a million dollar value of the mortgage, um, charitable deductions, state and local taxes, which are deductible, um, on the IRA, your IRA and pensions, um, the individual retirement accounts, which are, uh, th that income isn't taxed in the year you earn it. For, a, for traditional. Um, that, is three, that adds up to $370 billion a year, just the top five that are for personal. There's a bunch of corporate ones too. Um, just to give you a sense of how big this is, what this graph is telling you is that um, tax expenditures are as big as discretionary spending. So all of, all of the stuff that normal people think of as the government. You know, people outside of Washington think that like Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid, that's like tiny. And they think that foreign aid is like 20% of the budget. They do, they do. This is part of Brian's book, right? Uh, they have this, in, you know. So, so, but this is, the tax expenditures are enough to pay for discretionary spending. So, um, from an economist's point of view, um, eliminating tax expenditures has a benefit that you you get more money without raising marginal tax rates for people. You can still keep the same statutory rate. Say so our top rate right now is officially 35 for a, for a little while, for another couple of months. You can keep that 35% and still raise a lot of taxes from um, high income Americans by sort of capping this or capping that or capping that. So there are versions of that that float around a lot in the US lexicon, US political lexicon. Um, the Obama administration's plan for this is to basically cap the, um, ability, the rate at which um, high income earners can deduct. Right now, if you are a high income earner and you, you know, give $1 in charity, give $1 to a charity, that, say, that cuts your tax bill by 35 cents because you're in the top rate. Every dollar you give to a charity cuts your taxes by 35 cents. Every dollar you pay in state and local taxes cuts your taxes by 35 cents. Every dollar you pay in mortgage interest cuts your taxes by 35 cents because the top rate's 35. The um, administration's proposal is to cap that so that if you um, are above a certain income level, all of these deductions, uh, the core ones, mortgage interest, charitable, state and local, I, I know that's wrapped in, well, you'd only get to cut your taxes by 28 cents on the dollar, which is the rate for people sort of in the middle. So it's a way to basically, it would discourage people buying big homes which nowadays isn't, maybe, sound, maybe that sounds like a good policy idea. That'd be another talk. Um, it would discourage the rich from giving to charities. They, they are tax sensitive. It would discourage, it would, 
it would, the rich would spend more time pressuring state and local governments to pay, to cut taxes, certainly. Um, so, but it would, so it would have some fairly clear effects. Um, but that's just one thing that people are going to be looking at. Um, you know, getting rid of tax expenditures, cutting back on tax expenditures is not small potatoes. The top five is an enormous chunk of money. Um, I always knew it was big, but until I saw this chart, I didn't know how this. The GAO did a nice study of this in 05. Um, that I didn't put the whole title down, but that's enough to Google it. But um, they, they collected great data on that. So, but yeah, it's, uh, if, it's, yeah if it's not for you, it's, uh, it's, it's a loophole, right? Okay, so, so when, you ch when you raise rates, and when you, or when you ch cut rates, people respond to that, and people change their behavior. It's important to remember a point that uh, it's important for me to point out a certain fact, which is that a consumption tax, a national sales tax, these are still labor taxes. Okay, Ed Prescott, who won the Nobel Prize a couple years ago, he wrote a paper that sort of started battering economists over the head with this again, something that we'd forgotten, I think, or hadn't thought about too much, which is that a consumption tax, a sales tax, a VAT. They, yes, they discourage consumption. They also discourage work. Why? Well, aside from those few of us who work solely because of like the glory of helping our fellow persons, why do most of us work? You work to make money, but do you work to make money just to have the money or because you want to buy something later? Most of us want to buy something later. Some of us just like to brag about our incomes, but most of us choose to brag about our incomes by driving a flashy car by telling people we had a dinner at Citronelle, by, doing, uh, by telling people we went on vacation to Paris or Morocco, right? You, so even if you are trying to show off, you show off with the consumption. You show off with the C, right? Not with the L. Um, so labor is a means to an end, and that end is consumption. So um, when I talk here about um, changing what it would mean to change different taxes, I'll talk about labor taxes, but keep in mind, Consumption taxes have the same effect on labor. So, um, both in theory and in, and in practice. Because people always have an alternative to consuming, and that's leisuring. Economists usually just call it the alternative consumption. The alternative to consumption, we usually call it just leisure. But um, there's so many things other than buying stuff that can make you happy. We all know that, right? Spending time with friends. Um, you know, traveling nearby, going exercising, a lot of things that the government um, has not yet found a way to tax. So um, this goes back to an old survey, um, but it still sums up, I think, kind of the best numbers in the field. Uh, Fuchs, Poterba, and Kruger. Um, Poterba is now runs the National Bureau of Economic Research. Uh, smart guy, seems very friendly. Um, Journal of Economic Literature. So the big story about labor supply responses. The big story about work is that women, married women respond a lot more than men. Men, according to survey after survey after survey, and study after study, and experiment after experiment, men are just robots who just work mindlessly and, and, until they die, right? <laughs> that, it, this actually has changed slightly in recent decades, um, where you see that labor participation rates of men has declined, like men are retiring at younger ages, or they they sort of get more casual about their labor in their late 50s and early 60s. They're a little less aggressive about taking work than a few decades ago, once they get into their late 50s and early 60s. Um, my hunch, personally, is that the next generation is going to see a huge effect of a drop off of men in the labor supply because of uh, Xbox. Um, I think that's such a great alternative. It's so inexpensive, and like, it's just so awesome. It's just so much awesomer than most of real life. But um, until that happens, we've got, we're stuck with this fact, which is that married women are very sensitive. Married women act the way economists think people act, which is they respond to incentives. Um, they have good alternatives to, to working in the labor force. Um, that's working at home, basically, um, for, for, un, for not for cash. So uh, married women um, seem to have pretty good sized responses to a change in the tax rate. Um, I'm summing up, I'm boiling down their studies a bit here. Uh, so it's roughly speaking, 10% cut tax rate, 5% more hours. With men, it's like one fifth the effect. Um, surprisingly, from a lot of people's perspective, poor people actually respond more when it comes to hours, to like sort of the fraction of people in a group who work. 
I'm not literally talking about somebody working 40 hours versus 42 hours. I'm talking about looking at a whole group of people of married women and saying, how does their total group chunk of hours change? Most of that's by people just deciding not to work, rather half-time versus full-time. But uh, so low earners do respond a lot more. Um, and high earners seem to respond less when it comes to hours. But with the rich, it's not really about hours of work. It's about what you do. Um, high income people who work just tend to work a chunk of time. And the question is, are they going to make a lot of money or a little money? So they have options of taking an easy job versus a harder job. I have a friend who was an, uh, was an executive at a uh, stock firm, in the, a trading firm in the Midwest. And um, you know, he always had to, he had to decide, do I, wanna, do I really want to grab the brass ring and never see my family again? You know, do I really want to go for that? And do I want to climb to the next step of the corporate hierarchy? Do I want the corner office? Um, that's a real question. So the tax rate can have an effect on that decision. What kind of work you do, how stressful it is. Um, and then there's timing stuff. The rich are really good at timing their taxes. I, I'm, I'm quite sure you're going to get a big influx of capital gains revenue this year. You're going to get a huge chunk of capital gains revenue, especially in December this year. People are going to be selling their stocks and buying and selling stuff, trying to get everything fixed before the rates go up in 2011. So um, I have a bet with a, with a statistician, actually, who thinks that 2011 is going to be a huge depression year much bigger than what we saw last year. And uh, he's so convinced of this that uh, we made a $100 bet. So he's predicting a, a massive depression next year, about a 6% fall in the economy. And my guess is just gonna be, it's going to be less than 6. Whatever it is, it's going to be less than 6. But his story is all built around the fact that taxes are going up big time next year. And so people are going to do their work now. People are going to start businesses now. People are going to you know, get work done now, and then 2011 is going to be the great vacationing. So, um, so he thinks, I think people respond to tax incentives, but not to the extent he does. So, um, so how much do the rich change their taxable income when taxes change? For some purposes, what you folks care about is how much work people really do. For other purposes, what you folks care about is what gets reported on the 1040. This is focusing on what people report on the 1040. So um, range of estimates, uh, let me focus on the Gruber and Says number here. Says is like the, the sort of dean of modern public finance economists, um, modern tax economists, uh, now at Harvard. I guess it was at Berkeley earlier. So um, they think that uh, the rich do have a pretty decent sized response to, to um, changes, in the tax, uh, changes in the tax rate. Every time you increase the take home, the fraction of the take home pay, in other words, roughly speaking, every time you cut taxes by 1%, you get a 0.6% rise in taxable income. I did a back of the envelope estimate just based on this crude number. Last night I worked this out in Excel. If this was, if I took this number completely literally, just completely literally, the um, optimal tax rate for the rich would be 34%. If you, all you cared about was milking them for as much money as you can, if that's all you cared about. If you wanted to get the peak of what they call the Laffer curve. So that's 1% lower than it is right now. Now that's just a back of the envelope story, but um, uh, if you push it up higher, their, their taxable income, what shows up on their 1040 starts shrinking really quickly. Um, a lot of that comes from um, extra being more aggressive in taking deductions. That's what Say is found in a lot of his work. He finds that the rich get really, really aggressive about taking deductions and about finding tax deferral strategies and paying a lot of money to tax accountants the higher that uh, your bosses raise the rates. So um, you know, one path to good tax policy is if, um, a lot of, if a lot of tax accountants are coming into you and saying, um, if, you, if you guys pass this reform, you're going to put a lot of us out of work. That should be the stuff you, you vote for, right? That should be the stuff you put in the memo to the boss and you put that. Usually, I think the thing you want your boss to vote for, you put number two on the, on the list of options, right? One, two, three, A, B, C. B is always the one you want him to pick. I think that's, that's why I work for Nixon, according to memoirs. Um, Austin Goolsby, who works in the administration, has um, found some estimates that are a little lower in the long run, but a lot bigger in the short run. He finds that the rich are really good at paying 
any of your tax gains. He looked at what happened when uh, President Clinton uh, came into office. So he looked at, you know, in between 92 and 93 when it became clear, okay, it's November, late November, early December, Bush just lost big time. Um, the rich new taxes were going up. What did they do in, at the end of 92? Did they literally put in a lot of long hours in December so they could get all their work done? No. What they did is they timed the purchases of, time, time the um, option exercising and the exercising of stock purchases so that they made a lot of their money in 92. And so 93 was a sort of dry year for taxes from the rich. A little bit of long run effect, but not, not as much as say funds. So there's this idea of the Laffer curve. How many people here have ever heard of the Laffer curve? Okay, most people. So, but not everybody. So Art Laffer um, is famous for a economic theory that he wrote on the back of a napkin. Um, he did that because back in his day they didn't have Twitter, right? People made fun of this idea because you know he wrote it on the back of a napkin. How good can an idea be? But most good economic ideas are just these little aphorisms, these little one-liners. So not all of them. Some of them are complex and take hours to explain, but a lot of them are these one-liners. He drew this on the back of a cocktail napkin, supposedly. And he said, OK, if your tax rate was 100%, people would, it's not that nobody would work, it's that nobody would work and report it to the government. People might work, they might not, but they wouldn't report it to the government. If you had a tax rate of zero, the government wouldn't raise any revenue for another reason, because they just have a tax rate of zero. And so there's some point in the middle, I don't know where it is, you drew it right here because it looks like 50%, but um, there's some point in the middle, which is the, the top, where you get the sweet spot, where your tax rate's low enough that people actually are willing to report their money to the government, uh, but at the rate's high enough that you actually can make some money, that the government can make some money off. So um, he thought, he wrote this in, in 1978 or so. He came up with this idea and started popularizing it. Um, the late Jack Kemp uh, pushed in the House of Representatives for um, bringing back, uh, bringing down top tax rates as a result. Anybody here know what the top tax rate was in the late, in the late 70s during the Carter years? 70%, yes. The top rate on paper was 70%. So as you can imagine, the rich were paying a lot of games. They were paying a lot of money to their accountants to try to get away from that 70%. And um, the President uh, Reagan, uh, with, the work of, with the help of uh, Jack Kemp and others, uh, passed a bill to bring the top rate down from 70 to what in 81? It brought it down to 50. And um, so Brad DeLong, who worked, uh, who's a prominent blogger, and he works at Berkeley, and he works in the Clinton Treasury, and um, blogs a lot. He, he ends up uh, talking with my colleagues a lot through the blog blogosphere. He says that reducing the top rate from 70 to 50% is probably a revenue gainer and surely not much of a loser. So we're getting back to the point in the US where these 50% numbers are starting to seem more closer to, closer to fate, right? If you have. If the top rate goes back up to 39.6, which I'll call 40, and you've got this new Medicare tax, um, you've got the Medicare tax that's higher for high earners, uh, and on capital gains for, the, for high earners, and the 5% surtax people have talked about, you start getting up to this 50% level, which is maybe on the right side of the lever curve, maybe not. But I think across the board, macro economists around the world are like, wow, 50. If you add up all of the different tax rates, all of the different income tax rates, and that adds up to something higher than 50 years. Probably on the wrong side. So Laffer himself, um, he gets stuck with this idea that he thought that all tax cuts paid for themselves. He's never said that. In an interview in Time Magazine two years ago, he pointed this out. Um, he just points out that people really respond to incentives. Now that said, Laffer has made a prophecy of my bet with this gentleman. Um, was inspired by an article I read by Laffer, where um, Laffer, Laffer said that he thinks it's going to be a huge depression next year. He thinks 2011 is going to be terrible because of all the uh, tax increases. Um, so that's what inspired this. So Laffer thinks that people really, really respond to tax incentives. That's Ed Prescott, Nobel Prize winner, is another guy who thinks that people respond much more to tax incentives than I, than I do. So there are smart people who disagree with me on this, um, people worth paying attention to, and people who, people who should be testifying before committees. So 
Um, so let me wrap up um, with uh, talking about taxing capital income in theory. Um, there's, uh, this is one of the strangest results in pure economic theory I know of. The Nash equilibrium result is pretty awesome. There's a couple other ones uh, that are pretty, like something where you can just do a little math proof like in a geometry class and get something kind of great at the end. Chomley Judd. Chomley Judd gave us this result. Uh, it's been around for 20 some odd years and economists who really want to tax the rich always have to fight against this result. Every article, every academic piece that wants to say we need to have higher taxes on the rich or we have to have higher taxes on capital or higher taxes on corporate profits, they have to wrestle with this result in their paper. So there are way, ways around it, but it's tough. So a little like Jacob wrestling the angel, you know? If you can beat an angel, you know, good for you. you know, you're pretty awesome. So they said that taxing capital is a bad idea. There's actually a paper with that title. Um, and cap capital income is any income that's about you doing something today that will pay off in the future. Um, in general, it includes corporate income taxes, interest and profit taxes, capital gains taxes, um, any of these kinds of income. It's a striking result. The key idea is that, uh, that goes on in the model is that part of the reason you earn more today than people decades ago, not the whole reason, Part of the reason you earn more today than people did decades ago is because you have more machines to help you at work. Those machines make you more productive, and then you and the boss split the gains of how much extra awesome the machines make you. So if there's less capital around, fewer machines and equipment, crummier machines and equipment, outdated machines and equipment, you're less productive, so you're not making as much, so the boss doesn't have as much to split with you. So capital tax causes less capital, which causes lower wages in the long run. Um, and the nice result, I forget whether it was Chomley or Judd who proved this, uh, which of the two of them, but they, said they showed in their model, if you had a vote, if people in the society had a vote, if the capitalists are just one class, and the workers are just another class, and the workers got a, had to vote on this, and you said, told the voters, I'll give you two options. We have a tax on capital, and we give all of the money directly to you every single dollar versus option two. We have no tax on capital, but in return, we know what's going to happen, which is you get more machines and more equipment, and they help you more product, be, be more productive. They show, they show that um, future-minded workers would actually vote to, to, to pay for their government by taxing themselves, not by taxing the capital. Because having the machines to work with is so valuable to you that you'd rather pay for your government through a labor tax you, the worker, would rather pay for your government through a labor tax rather than through a capital tax. I, I'm amazed that this is true. Like, I thought, when I read this, and I, I didn't even get taught this in grad school. I learned it years later. I, my professor just, I, maybe they thought it was too dangerous, you know? No, this is, a third, this is just pure theory. This is pure theory. This is like, if you actually, if people were actually rational. We know voters aren't rational. We know voters don't know how the system works. We know voters don't know how the economy works. Voters don't even know how, I mean, citizens don't know how medicine works, right? They, people don't know how their toilet works, right? <laughs> so how are they gonna understand this, right? So I don't know how my toilet works. So, um, so this is something that like, if people were actually rational, they would actually think this way. If people were future-minded and prudent, that's what they would do. This is just a theory. Um, there are arguments against it, but it's surprising how clean and general this result is. I don't mind teaching this one because it's so robust. It's one of these things that comes up again and again. It's a little bit like the, I don't know, the three-sided triangle adding up to 80, 180 degrees. It's about like that. Um, so this is, this is the story. Yeah, this is the same point. Um, there, is some, there is a fair amount of evidence that if you did switch to some kind of consumption tax, whether it was a pure, from our current system, from our mixed motley crew of tax packages to a pure consumption tax, that um, the economy would grow faster. When, when people surveyed it, there are a lot of little channels it works through, a lot of little channels. But if you boil it all down by just saying, let's go survey a bunch of economists and ask them, um, how, how much faster would the economy grow? How much richer would we be in the long run if we did this? 0.2% um, faster growth, I don't know, that's worth getting excited about. The optimists thought that you'd get about a half a percent faster growth a year if you switched to a pure consumption tax. Say a pure VAT instead of the national income tax. 
Um, so I don't know if that's a big number or a small number. It's not like 200%. If it were 200%, I'd say my whole talk would have been about this. But it's not 200%. It's 10%, 25% richer. So building up more machines, building up more equipment, getting citizens to be more future-minded. Yeah, that pays off. Uh, no miracle, but, but it pays off. Um, so let me take a second to talk about the corporate income tax. Um, your constituents seem to think that there are these things called corporations that pay taxes. Right? Even some of your bosses might think that. I'm not sure. But you do know that only human beings can pay taxes, right? Only human beings can pay taxes. If a corporation on paper is paying a tax, who's, who's giving up that money? A corporation? I mean, if there were, then like, OK. When, Somehow, the corporate income tax is a, burden, is a burden that's borne by actual human beings somewhere. Maybe it's just the, the chief executives who take it in the form of less pay. Maybe the, more, the higher the corporate income tax you have, the less pay the executives get. OK, maybe th that's what it is. Um, but on, on average, it seems like what happens when you tax corporations is you're telling people, um, don't, uh, don't build up, don't make as much. It's a profit tax, right? The corporate income tax is a profit tax. And it works the same way as any other profit tax. Profit taxes discourage the accumulation of capital. They discourage the accumulation of machines and equipment. They discourage long-run thinking. They encourage short-run thinking. So uh, it's the clearest example of what it seems to be is a capital tax. It's partly a sales tax on things buy from corporations. So that means consumers end up paying it. It seems to be a, partly a labor tax. Partly it's a tax on just people organizing as a corporation. I mean, there's more than one way to set up a business, right? You can be an, a limited liability company. You can be a partnership. You can be a corporation. You can be a sole proprietorship. Corporate income tax is just a sort of a tax on a business person who decides to set up their business a certain way. So the idea that a corporate income tax is actually paid by something called a corporation that's not a human, you know, it has to be wrong, right? Only humans can bear the burden of tax. Um, but this is something where it's, there's still debate over how, how, to what extent it works as a labor tax or capital tax or a sales tax. This is, this is where the battle goes on. Um, so, some, so regardless of what it is, just keep in mind that there's some human being bearing that cost. I just don't know who it is. Um, so to conclude, let me just point out that, that you are going to be stuck with low revenue for a lot of years. So that's apparently going to be a fact of life unless there's a big economic miracle that doesn't seem to happen after financial crisis. Um, another fact is that our tax system is progressive. It uh, may not be as progressive as you like, or might be more progressive than you like, but it is overall, taking into account federal income and social security taxes, still progressive. Um, tax rates really do change the amount of savings and work that people actually do. And um, capital taxation is bad in theory, but very popular in practice. So. Um, let me take a couple questions.